Hey hey, it's JK and it's time. You've all been commenting asking for this for literally months and I finally gave in to the pressure and did it. Are you happy now? Are you ready for one of the biggest magic challenge runs ever done in a Souls game? Today, we're going to go through four cycles of Dark Souls 2, using only sorcery in New Game, then using only miracles in New Game Plus, and then using only hexes in New Game Plus Plus, and finally, only pyromancy in New Game Plus Plus Plus. The only other rules are no carrying spells and casting tools over from one cycle to the next, and no using any bonfire aesthetics. Worth mentioning, my goal is to beat all bosses in each of these cycles using only the specific magic type, but I'm not trying to acquire and use every single spell in the game, so if you're expecting me to, for example, farm for hours to get covenant items to get sunlight spear, then I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. Do you know how long this run's going to take anyway? Worth noting that some of the bosses in this game are just pretty easy, so I won't be covering their fights in huge excruciating detail unless it's needed. Also, for no reason, I didn't use the Hexer's Hood, the Lion Mage set, or any of the Clutch Rings throughout this whole playthrough, because I enjoy making things harder for myself for no reason. Well, let's dive right in. We start with the best visual representation of how this run is going to make me feel, and then come up with an obviously really clever name of a famous wizard. Make sure to comment below how much he looks like Benedict Cumberbatch, or I'm going to use his magic to make you watch the Marvels on an infinite loop. We choose Sorcerer as the starting class, and Healing Wares as the gift. After more than enough of these women's nonsense already, we head to Medulla and speak to the Emerald Herald who gives us an almost useless item. Our first stop is Hyde's Tower of Flame. We test out our starting spell Soul Arrow, and unsurprisingly, damage is not great. Dragon Rider decided to ride a slipstream downwards into the water below, and we make sure to speak to Lycia so she moves location. Next, we head to the Fall of Forest Giants to buy a smelly branch and get the covetous Silver Serpent Ring. We use Dragon Rider's Soul for more souls and buy Lena Grass Key before returning to Medulla to level up intelligence and attunement. Spell casts work like Dark Souls 1 in that you have a set number of uses of each spell before you rest at a bonfire, but you can increase this number by leveling attunement this time round. We open Lazy Grass Shop because he couldn't be bothered to climb through a window and then head to No Man's Wharf. We run through at wharf speed, call the ship, unlock the shortcut, and speak to this guy who left his car on a hill. He sells the clear bluestone ring for faster casting, and we also farm enemies nearby to buy great soul arrow and some spell restoring items. We need a few more souls, so we take on the boss of the area, Flexile Sentry. It's a pretty slow fight, but fairly easy as we blast him in the gut multiple times until he gets dysentery in his bowels. We buy Great Heavy Soul Arrow and use the Flexile Sentry Soul to level up more. My hunger for souls and murder is high, so we kill Seldora the Explorer for his armor. We also upgrade our staff. I also realized that I could have got a free Great Soul Arrow instead of farming to buy one. Oops. Lost Giant isn't very defiant, and in 30 seconds he becomes the Extinct Giant. Melencia waterfowls her way to Medulla, and we upgrade the staff again and level up. This next boss is a big armoured guy. We bait his charge and fire soul arrows at him. Guess you could describe his charges as trivial pursuits? Now, we're going to do a bit of running around here. We unlock Lost Bastille and Huntsman's Cops. We level up yet again, and we already have 40 intelligence after just three bosses. Gotta love Dark Souls 2. We can now use Soul Spear, which we get from Huntsman's Cops, but there's more goodies elsewhere I want to get. In Shaded Woods, we grab the Chloranthi Ring plus one and the Clear Bluestone Ring plus one, and we learn that free aiming spells is absolute trash. So, Scorpioness Najka. This boss has much more health than the previous ones and resists magic, so the fight took a long time. We blast her with our spells, and she fires off some magic of her own, but with enough patience and casting, she goes down too. We get up to 47 intelligence, but more importantly, we can get the best staff in the game right here in Brightstone Cove. We just have to kill this mimic for the Staff of Wisdom. But we need 50 intelligence. I decided to use Najka's soul. It can be traded for a spell called Soul Shower, but it's total toss, so I don't mind missing out on it. We get up to 49 int, and after we farm hides a bit more, we are at last up to 50. I go to Shaded Ruins again to get Twinkling Titanite, and bring the Staff of Wisdom to plus one. I also buy Shockwave and Soul Spear Barrage and Yearn. The first one is not great, but the other two will definitely come in handy at certain points. We beat Congregation barely by running a lot, but the Prowling goes down in two hits with Great Magusto. After leveling health a little, we grab another Twinkling Titanite in Brightstone Cove and buy a Pharos Lockstone from Alentia. 
With this, we can get another twinkling titanite in Dora Faris to upgrade the staff again. There's also a faint stone here, which is handy. In the Lost Bastille, we kill pursuers with twinkling titanite, get the antiquated key, and open Macduff's workshop. He infuses our staff with the faint stone, and we can get Macduff to move for another twinkling. We need to unlock the other route into the Lost Bastille, so we take a boat from No Man's Wharf. This route has another pursuer who we kill for another twinkling to level the staff to plus three. Just to mention, several of these steps I'll probably do in the upcoming cycles as well, but I won't cover them again in this detail just to avoid repetition. We buy life gems and then unpetrify this really ungrateful guy on the way to ruin the sentinels. Three soul spear barrages almost takes out the first sentinel, two soul spears take off half health of the second. A few great heavy soul arrows finish them off shortly after, but as is tradition, I nearly choke to the last one, but they go down. I level to 25 attunement and 13 vigor with the souls gained from them. We kill another pursuer for twinkling, grab the Bastille key, and free strayed. I buy cast light just to make certain areas a little nicer later. I use the sentinel soul as heavy homing soul arrow sucks and level up faith a little to prepare for the next cycle. I think we're in a pretty solid position now, so let's start blasting through some bosses. We light the fires outside the lost sinner, and then she died in five hits. This sinner ain't rising anytime soon. We duke it out with dear Freya, but she should have quit while she was ahead. Just to mention, I realize with my order that I'm doing I won't be able to get Crystal Soul Spear, as Freya only drops the soul for that in New Game Plus, but honestly I don't think it's needed given our damage here, and this order felt the most logical to me, especially given a later boss we'll talk about. Executioner's Chariot is up next. We kill the Necromancer easily, let the Chariot handle the skeletons, and then this beast shouts at me until its throat becomes hoarse, at which point we blast it to death with spells. We show no mercy to Rowena, who dies in two hits. Skeleton Lords. Now, you might think a gank boss might be annoying for this build, but not so actually. Kill the one that spawns bone wheels first, kill them easy, the other two hordes are easily handled thanks to Yearn and Soul Spear Barrage. We beat one pursuer that I forgot about, so now we got three twinkling. Covetous Demon wasn't able to covet us as we annihilate him. Earthen Peak as always is about as fun as giving Donald Trump a blumpkin. That's called a Trumpkin by the way. We set the windmill on fire and head down this ladder to Gilligan's Island to get another twinkling titanite. We unlock the hidden bonfire and upgrade our staff to plus four. Baneful Queen Mitha has some resistance to magic, but uh, didn't help her very much. Thank god I didn't Mitha with any of my spells. After taking the lift which enraged a thousand souls fans, I slaughter both of the annoying NPCs at the start of this area as Sharon gets fenced and Dennis gets harmored. Majorold is also here and we buy full control and another great heavy soul arrow. Iron Keep is normally absolute hell, but magic rips through everything here, so getting to smelt a demon is much smoother than usual. As for this big armored demon, he was smell terminated in just over a minute. Good thing there isn't a version of this boss that resists magic instead of fire. We level up attunement a bit more, and then I encounter an NPC invader I've never seen before, Oliver the Collector. He stood there and did nothing. I then grabbed a twinkling titanite in the area, and destroyed Diablo 2 in about 45 seconds. Next, we use full control to get down the well in Medulla, and then cast light to get us through the gutter into the Black Gulch as quick as possible, because both these areas are extremely unpleasant. We then kill this gullible NPC near the bonfire. Next up is the Misperotten Crusader, a large mass of flailing bodies that attacks slowly and gets drilled with spells. At the primal bonfire, Audia talks rubbish, but we return to the Black Gulch and quickly kill the giants to get the forgotten key. We can open the door down the pit to get Soul Vortex as well as the entry item for the Sunken King DLC. I was excited to try this spell, and it seemed like a good time to clear off some other base game bosses. I thought it would be good against the Royal Rat Vanguard, but uh, sadly, no. These statues vanguard the rats from it, it seems. I ended up just using Great Soul Arrow. Speaking of terrible rat bosses, this royal rat didn't respect my authority. This was terrible as usual, but at least I could kill the rats quickly here. Stupid boss. Stupid boss! Last optional boss for now, the Belfry Gargoyles. I didn't do as much damage as I was expecting, but was still able to take them out quick enough that I didn't get overwhelmed. One step closer to Bell Freedom. Time to approach Drang Lake Castle. Not surprised it's Drang Lake with all this rain. Soul Vortex was good for taking out the Mammoth Knights, and we enter the castle. We can grab another Twinkling Titanite from the Poison Dart Room, and Nameless Usurper doesn't seem to like here our attacks, as they just take spells to the face. Twin Dragon Riders, 
was a boss. Now we can get Soul Greatsword, which I'm very excited to use. With our large rod in hand, we can now force our way into the King's Passage. We test Soul Greatsword on the enemies before the Fog Gate, and it seems pretty cool. Looking Glass Knight is our next boss. Love the setting for this one, and check this out, its shield reflects spells. Soul Greatsword did awesome damage, and in conjunction with our spells, we're able to defeat the summon, and we give this boss a glass kicking. We enter Shrine of Amana, but level up a bit first. I grabbed three more Twinkling Titanite, and now we can level our staff to max. Shrine of Amana wasn't too bad thanks to abusing some enemy AI. It was then time for a Requiem for the Demon of Song. This was actually no hit. Much like the other games, sorcery is still pretty overpowered. We hitch to Undead Ditch and buy another Soul Spear from Agdane, and then somehow survive this onslaught in this small corridor. Felstad the Bell Bearing Hunter was not particularly happy to see us. He hits like a truck, but as long as we avoid his attacks, we can respond in kind with our spells. We deal loads of damage during his phase transition with Soul Spears, and not long after that, we send him to Hellstad. With the King's Ring, we can enter Aldia's Keep, where we can get the spell with the highest intelligence requirement in the game, Soul Geyser. Now, we know FromSoft like to have a character called Ian appear in every game, and Dark Souls 2 is no exception. So say hello to Ian the Guard Dragon. Hi Ian. Bye Ian. Although I accessed Dragon Eyrie, my fight with Ian reminded me of his brother, who was also called Ian back in Hides, as well as Dragon Slayer Armor, who died in 4 hits. After hearing Tiny Audia talk a load of Tiny Toss, we test our Soul Geyser. It doesn't seem that amazing to be honest. But anyway, we drowned our sorrows by gobbling Ancient Dragon's toe cheese. Delicious. Although I have many souls, I don't want to level Faith more now, or the Miracles run will be too easy. Let's just try and get the base game finished off. I sort out the giant memories, and Soul Geyser annihilates this big shoulder giant, so it did do something at least. I then lord my power over this giant from the safety of this platform. With 5 giant souls, Vendrick is pretty easy, and we spam many many soul spears into his thigh before he Vendricks the bucket. Before we finish off the story bosses, we got to enter the Dark Chasms. They were mainly fine, the one under Dranglake Castle can suck my Dark Chasm though. I thought Dark Lurker might handle magic a bit better, but uh, not really. This has to be one of the best Dark Lurker finishes ever though. So the final boss gauntlet, let's chin it off. Throne Watcher and Defender was tougher than other fights due to gank, but in the end, they were unable to defend themselves and could do nothing but watch as I killed them. Nashandra Bullock was easy, and Aldir was annoying and took a while due to having to wait for him to become vulnerable. I need a scholar, scholar, a scholar's what I need, hoo hoo. With the base game finished at last, we can enter the Sunken King DLC. Hi Sin! It's very noticeable that enemies resist magic a lot more here compared to anything else we've encountered. For ease, I tricked some knights into this hole, managed to hit this switch with magic, and then got the dragon stone. I also got focused souls and instantly forgot about it. Right, let's get the worst fight out the way first. Gank Squad is a mega annoying and tedious boss. I actually died for the first time in ages here. I then took out Varg and Grave Robber first for once, and then sniped Sarah from above. Explore this! Elana next. This boss wasn't squalidding around. Thankfully, she didn't summon Velstad at all, just skeletons. I took out the first bunch, but when she summoned again, I decided to focus my damage just on her. Took a while, and there were some close calls, but as long as I waited for the right openings, we had the damage to get it done. I hope we have the same luck with her summoning only the skeletons in the other cycles. So the only boss left in this DLC is Sin. He really resisted magic, and Toxic was a problem especially when you let him land on you like this. Easily, the longest fight so far, but mainly because he just kept flying loads. A great attack, Sindo, occurs when you time it right dodging back from his head swipe, and then use Soul Greatsword to smack him right in the mush. It took a while, and I had to remember how to avoid that diving fire attack, but with one final cast, DLC 1 is complete. In the old Iron King DLC, you can use full control to skip several parts. I tried the big jump skip, but died a lot so probably wasn't worth it. Now for anyone wondering why I did sorcery first, part of the reason was I absolutely did not want to do blue smelter on any higher cycles because as you might guess, he resists magic a lot. The hardest boss in the sorcery run so far, I died several times actually. 
I ended up using bright bugs and magic restoring items because it was actually necessary here. His attacks often have delays which can be hard to predict and given the length of the fight here there's more and more opportunities for me to make a mistake. I know how to avoid some of his swings fairly consistently and the jump attack is always a good opening. Victory here cured me of the blues and I felt confident to take on the other two bosses of this DLC. At this point I did remember about Focus Souls and equipped that to hopefully help me out. Fume Knight comparably was way easier than Blue Smelter Demon. Focus Souls did decent damage, run away, dodge and cast. Damage is much better than Blue Smelter. I actually never noticed how easy it is to avoid pretty much all Fume Knight's attacks by just dodging backwards repeatedly. Range absolutely smokes him, he was running on fumes by the end. It'd suck if we had to fight him with something that barely did any damage and had minimal cast though. I grab the Iron King crown and we head off to take on Sir Alon. He was tougher than Fume Knight due to his speedy attacks. I also hadn't leveled ADP or Endurance which probably would have helped here. Unlike Fume Knight, staying close is actually way better as being behind him is the only position where he can't respond with an attack quickly. Even here our damage against him isn't amazing and it was far from a clean fight so I have a strong feeling this is going to be tough in the coming cycles. But for now, we leave Alonis Morissette head over feet. Bosses like this are the reasons I drink. Final DLC at last. Oh my god, we haven't even completed one cycle yet. I just run through Elium Lois because I didn't want to waste time. Compared to basically every other DLC boss so far, Arva was much more straightforward. Rolling through the swipes and then casting on the other side is a super effective way of dealing safe damage as long as you don't get greedy. We eat this cat's health bar with a nice Chianti and some fava beans and move on. So now we gotta find those knights. I used to love this DLC, but it's pretty horrible to speedrun. I remembered that the Iron King crown restores 20% of spell cast every 2 minutes, which seemed actually really useful for once, so I used it for the rest of this run. With all 3 knights freed, it was time for the Ivory King. I find this fight kinda annoying because of having to do the knights every single time and there isn't really a way to speed it up. I died a couple times to him, that lightsaber does a lot of damage. I realised that low ADP was screwing me over, so I levelled this up as better dodging was essential here. On the next attempt, despite this, I choked at the last moment. His attack windows aren't too difficult to work out, but I get panicky after I take a hit or two. The knowledge that I have to do the knights over again hanging over my mind. Again, dodging through the attacks and getting behind him to cast give the best openings. On the winning attempt, I casted as he was doing a jump attack and thankfully it did kill him. I would have definitely died if his attack had hit me, but luckily we brought him down from his ivory tower. With the final crown, I wish we could finish this now, but of course we need to light these fires, get the garrison ward key and enter the frigid freaking outskirts. There's no outskirting around it, it's awful as always. This is the one place where I'm safe stating outside the fog gate, because I'm not doing that again. The twin kitty cats weren't too bad, the only part that gets intense is when both are active, but with some perfect dodging, Lud goes down, leaving me feline confident about our chances. I mainly just dodge while Zalan is buffed, and after a few more sorcery casts, this second tiger falls and the first cycle is complete. Now, given that we still have three more cycles to go, you can see this is a long journey and there are some painful fights to come. But what's even more painful is that many people watching these videos aren't subscribed. We're aiming for 100,000 subs this year, so if you want to see more crazy runs like this and help me get a plaque that I can use to cringe out my son when he's a teenager, why not help that number along? I promise you, there's many more great things to come. Well, we ditch our staff and finally move to New Game Plus. Now, I should state that I've never done New Game Plus in Dark Souls 2. Oh my god, what the hell is all this? I guess it makes sense, but there's a slightly different cutscene with these women when we get to the house. Neat. We run to Majula and go say hi to the dragon Cheddar. This time, we want to buy stuff from Lycia as she sells a chime, a faith boosting ring and the miracles force and lightning spear. Force isn't quite as powerful as Dark Souls 1, but still enough to force this enemy down this hole. We buy loads of stuff from Melentia and upgrade our chime to plus 3. We get killed by a red Danny phantom and try the last giant. Our damage is nowhere near good enough. That's bad, should have tried the giant last this time. We need some more miracles if we're going to get anywhere. We wharf to no man's head and grab a mit force. I had spare souls, so I opted to buy the silver cat ring and then mission to Huntsman's Cops, where these red phantom enemies hunt my man and try to cop a feel. Seriously, why are they red phantoms now? 
In any case, we fiddle around until we take the token of fidelity. There is a specific reason I wanted this, so just bear with this random seeming routing. Back in Hides, we force these enemies to see our point of view. I feel like I'm going to miss this miracle a lot in future cycles. Ian the Guard Dragon gets an early retirement with some lightning spears and we Jedi push off some more red phantoms. Fake Ornstein saunters towards us like Johnny Depp in Pirates of the Caribbean, ironic as our damage was so low that we had to use multiple amber herds to defeat him. Thankfully, his jump attacks among others are easy to dodge and punish. Targray is just past the boss room and he won't speak to you unless you have a token of fidelity in your inventory, so that's why we grabbed it earlier. He sells Heavenly Thunder and another emit force, greatly increasing our arsenal. We can now take on the last giant once again. Heavenly Thunder brings down a bunch of lightning strikes randomly. I imagine that this could be pretty inconsistent, but it works great against a large enemy like this. We easily slay him with this and emit force, which does some giant lasting damage. In a similar vein, Pursuer easily goes down with lightning spears and emit force in an act of karma Pursutra. As to be expected, we fly to Lost Bastille and get the antiquated key. We can actually use Emit Force to blow up the barrel to Macduff, which is great because he sells infinite large titanite. Back to No Man's Wharf, this flexile fellow has sentry for some help and now has two turbulent tosses assisting him, but they're in water so Heavenly Thunder does more damage and luckily they get taken out quickly. Lightning Spears finish this one, thank god for extra water damage. After a boat trip to the other Lost Bastille entrance, we level Faith to 30, take the antiquated key route, ride the cage lift, and unlock Strayed and the bonfire. We upgrade our chime to plus 6 now. This probably seems like the most mishmash route ever, but we head to the gutter, run through, grab a Christmas lore log, and go to the Black Gulch. We force push the Woodland Twins, and then this time we kill one giant. It turns out exiting the game gives you the forgotten key if you do this, but the other giant is not dead for some reason. With the key, we can go to the pit and get Great Lightning Spear for even more damage. We do need 42 faith though, which we don't quite have yet, but we can get raw tens of thousands of souls by killing this boss here. Heavenly Thunder hits loads of times as he's a large enemy. There's actually going to be a few pretty big bosses in this game, so I kind of get the feeling that this is going to be more and more useful as the game goes on. Next, we take on the Sentinels strewn around this room. Given their smaller, more slender enemies, they're less susceptible to Heavenly Thunder, but Emit Force was there to pick up the slack. Its shockwave upon contact can damage more than one sentinel if they're close enough. A few blasts, and these ladies go down. Just past them, we can grab the Priest Chime from the Pursuer Room, and with a Bolt Stone we get from Targray, we upgrade the Priest Chime to plus 9 and infuse it with lightning for even more damage on our lightning miracles. I then killed these Pursuers for… no real reason to be honest, and headed down to the last sinner. This is the second of two fights that had additional enemies added in New Game Plus. It's actually a lot harder because of it. The problem is, the two new Pyromancer enemies that join dodge my projectiles. I died quite a few times here, I actually think I will need to come back to this one as these defeats left me feeling pretty lost. So how about the Skeleton Hordes instead? The Lords get scale shocked and then Heavenly Thunder crushes the Skeleton Hordes with minimal issue actually because there's water in the arena. Very handy. We level Faith, which has now reached 42 with our Faith Ring on. We pay a visit to Cloan and buy Soul Appease a yes please. This damages hollow enemies a lot and has some specific cases where it will be very useful. Sadly, it doesn't work on these pyromancers who one shot me now. Conversely, Covetous Demon gets wrecked hard by Heavenly Thunder and sent to Heaven. Mitha also is surprisingly a large enough target for Heavenly Thunder to be effective. Seems lightning is very dangerous for this queen. Up in Iron Keep, Force helps to destroy Sharon and Dennis. Why do these NPC invaders sound like an old married couple? At this point, I knew that trying to clear out Iron Keep on New Game Plus was going to suck hard, so instead I somehow ran to Smelter Demon Foggate on the first try. Literally no idea how I did that. Again, because this demon is a large target and because Heavenly Thunder is awesome, the damage we dealt it to Smelter was pretty immense. Let's hope it's the same for his DLC counterpart. First try. I then cheese my way through the next part of Iron Keep, even furiously fromaging forlorn and this red phantom near the bonfire. I mean he actually just walked into the fire so it's not really my fault. Old Iron King continues to mislead as it doesn't look like he's made of iron or a day over 30, but in any case, big target plus heavenly thunder equals dead. But as it's new game plus, he now drops the old king's soul, which we can trade for the miracle blinding bolt, but we need 65 faith. Will this miracle actually be worth it? Only one way to find out. We head to Shaded Woods now. 
Thankfully, we can blow up these barrels with emit force, avoid the annoying gank, and handle the enemies far more easily as we're not cramped in a small room. Scorpioness Najka, I'm, I'm just gonna say it, Heavenly Thunder's awesome. My favorite miracle so far easily. It was an absolute scorpion necessity for killing Najka here. Remember I said soul appease would appease my soul at some point? Well, with Royal Rat Authority, it works on the little rats and it kills them all at once. I take out the big guy with Heavenly Thunder and feel irrational happiness. It also works on the Royal Rat Vanguard. Look how many rats died there. This is amazing. Onto Brightstone Cove, and in case you've never done New Game Plus in Dark Souls 2, you get an early encounter with Freya exclusive to New Game Plus. Any damage you do here actually carries over to the boss fight as well, which is a nice touch. Solapis hurts all of the enemies in this next boss fight, thankfully they all congregate together. This makes this boss even easier than usual. Now, the proper fight with Freya. Thankfully, the spider mobs are afraid of fire, so this again is pretty easy while carrying a torch. Lightning does decent damage here. There's no reason to do Executioner's Chariot now, but I'm in the mood for horsing around, so why not? Thankfully, we can take out the Necromancers pretty fast with our lightning. That's the only part that causes issues, really. Oh wait, we actually get the Claranthi Ring plus two from killing it. I, I, I mean, <clears throat> obviously I planned this the whole time. I executed it perfectly. Okay, so now can we take out the Lost Sinner and his two Pyroad blocks? Well, thankfully the Pyros now die in two hits. Once they're down, the fight's not too bad, although the Sinner's charging stab always has way more range than I think it does. Our build has much better synergy now, so the last of the Great Souls falls. Audia bothers us, and then we head to Drang Lake Castle. Why even add this Red Phantom here before the Shrine of Winter? What's the point? Anyway, we enter Drang Lake Castle, the enemies outside were easy to kill thanks to the rain. But we have a slightly unusual route to go. We actually head to Gandalf the Dark and then meet him in the other two locations also. On the route to the third one, Forlorn invades us because of course he does, but we run away. Wait, I can't join a covenant while there's an invader here? Why are all my attempts to do anything in this game forlorn? Anyway, I had turned him into Force Lorn and he had a short trip with a bad ending. Now we can finally enter the abyss where Force continues to be a top tier miracle. I thought the Black Gulch portal didn't have any holes, so killing this dodging pyro guy was pretty annoying, but then I realized there is a hole near where you light the fire, so see ya. We clear the final abyss with more force, and now we can access the location of the boss of the abyss. Dark Lurker takes good damage from our attacks, and when it does the splitting move, Heavenly Thunder hits both of them, which puts us in a strong position. Finding this last opening was tough though as the magic spam becomes intense at points. Once one of them lands from the flying laser, I take the risk and peel off a heavenly thunder which gets the job done. The reason I wanted to do this now? I wanted the dragon chime. Best chime in the game. Even at plus three it's much better than the priest chime, and at plus four it goes even beyond that. We go back to take on the belfry gargoyles, and if force is the top tier miracle, heavenly thunder is a close second, as it really puts in work here. Grab more twinkling and upgrade the chime to plus five for max damage. We force Lycia, and now it's time to slaughter the rest of the base game. Dragon riders actually don't ride dragons. They ride a lightning powered roller coaster down to hell. I easily take out these guys, shouldn't have tried to take me head on. I also killed this two headed horse for no reason, definitely feeling kinda headstrong at this point. After riding the lift up, I open the door, but looked away to speak to my wife, only to find a red phantom attack me. Dick move. Die, red phantom! We push firmly with both hands until we fully enter the King's Passage and prepare for Looking Glass Night. Now, conveniently, it's raining which means for the whole fight, Mirror Mode takes extra damage from Lightning. Heavenly Thunder hits multiple times, and two Lightning Spears kills his summons. We do take some hits from Mist Timing, but overall, we defeat him, but it won't be for the glass time. Heavenly Thunder is also awesome for Shrine of Amana due to all the water. Enemies still take multiple hits though. Also, why the hell is the lock on range randomly so short at times? To get through, we lure the archdrakes into here and Heavenly Thunder chins them off. You wanna hear my next joke? Demon of Song. That's the joke. I'm already sick of this guy and we're not even halfway through. We buy effigies and Elizabeth mushrooms from Agdane and we can finally use Blinding Bolt as we've got 65 faith. I guess we can test it against Velstad, see if we can ring his bell. Blinding Bolt, turns out is not great. It's pretty inaccurate and the damage isn't that high. I mean, I know Heavenly Thunder is also inaccurate, but it seems to hit more than that. In fact, it hits Belstad multiple times during the phase transition or his projectile attack, which are definitely the best times to attack him with it. 
You get the eye gist of it anyway, he goes down. We blast through Audia's keep, and Ian the guard dragon gets absolutely destroyed so badly that he flips out at the end. This was followed by literally the quickest ancient dragon fight ever, 1 minute and 45 seconds to finish him off with a relentless barrage of heavenly thunder. He's not just history, he's ancient history. While here, we get the third dragon ring, as I didn't get it last time, and we level endurance as we don't need more faith or intelligence. There's more red phantoms on the way to the giant memory, who we take a forceful approach towards, and then giant lord heavenly thunder something something, and then we vendrickly finish off this naked guy waving his massive sword around. Now, it's important to try and mix up my routing so this time, I'll do the DLC before the final boss. Similar to the sorcery run, damage resistances for enemies really increase moving to the DLC. We manage to hit ceiling switches with lightning spear, and then force feed this jester a funny joke. Same for this guy. Oh wait, he's not dead. So, now I'd been feeling a sense of ganquility up to this point, but that was about to change. This was the most annoying boss on the run so far. I mean, it's always annoying really, but it seemed even worse here for some reason. But I realised at this point I'd missed some extra miracles that might help. First, from Cromwell, I get one more Heavenly Thunder. Pardon me, don't mind if I do. From Strayed, I get another Great Lightning Spear, and also trade Velstad's soul for Sacred Oath. Lastly, yet another lot of Great Lightning Spear from Undead Crypt. I equipped all apart from Sacred Oath, as I didn't realise it takes up 4 slots, which is crazy. Not worth the loss of ammo. My strategy for Gank Squad was as follows. Keep running, lure Varg and Grave Robber into the water, use Heavenly Thunder, repeat until they're in the grave. No Varguments here. We then Great Lightning Spear Sarah from a distance, and then one up close Heavenly Thunder to finish off Dora. Moving on, it's time for Alana again. Heavenly Thunder as the skeletons spawn to damage them, and then we can kill them off. She summoned Velstad, but I decided to just hit and run attack her instead of bothering with him. I luckily managed to kill her just as she summoned more skeletons. Thankfully, my damage against her is pretty good. This fight would probably really suck with low damage though. I thought Sin would be similarly easy to other large bosses, but Heavenly Thunder missed more than you'd think. You actually have to be right under him to do it. It still takes a lot of casts, and again his constant flying just drags the fight out longer than it needs to be. Eventually, our lightning manages to bring an end to this. But in the process, I learned some new lore. This dragon is actually related to Calamite. Turns out it's his cousin. Well, let's keep things rolling into the old Iron King DLC. Love that this DLC trolls you into thinking there's a boss right away. Remember my complaints earlier about lock on range? Well, I can lock onto this guy fine, and he's clearly way farther away. Weird. But with that guy dead, I noticed we can actually sneak past to the lever, which makes life easier instead of having to engage all those enemies. Sadly, I can't do the same in this room, but I just gotta pray. Or more appropriately, gotta have faith. We made it barely. Now, unfortunately, I forgot to bring Force for Quicksword Rachel, so I did the courageous thing and equipped the cat ring to drop off the side. I then stick my scorching iron scepter into this round hole, and prepare for the first boss of the DLC. Blue Smelter Demon was easier than the sorcery run, unsurprisingly, but I did die twice. Once because I got trapped in the corner, and the other from this totally fair hit. And don't start commenting saying you slowed down the footage and you can see it did hit me, because I already have, and it was nowhere near. Anyway, Heavenly Thunder go brrrr. Still took many casts due to his high HP, I also swapped a Great Lightning Spear for the opening after he does the jump attack. With a few more hits, Franklin D. Rosasmelt goes down. And speaking of going down, let's venture downwards ourselves now to offer this knight a nice refumeration package. He didn't take much damage from our attacks, but you can pretty easily run away and spam projectiles as we found out last time. I never realised how much he actually struggles to deal with range. It was a longer fight than usual, but not too bad overall. Up the tower, we get massacred by prowlers, and work our way through the memory to this weeb sitting alone in this room. Jokes aside, Sir Alon was much harder than anything else so far, just because of his speedy responses. Attacking when he's facing me regardless of where he is in the arena, is a bad idea. Also, our lightning does very little damage to him, even staggering him doesn't leave enough time to hit him with another before he counterattacks. Easily, the longest fight so far at 12 minutes. Sticking close to him and getting behind is the best and only strategy I managed to get some level of consistency from. This one took some real focus, but this was only the tip of the iceberg. In Elium Lois, we grab the Eye of the Tiger and then experience the thrill of the fight. Well, not really, Heavenly Thunder does great damage here due to Arva's widespread. Way above average damage. 
Weird that it seemed to struggle with sin, but Arvel was fine, but anyway, we send this boss into a permanent catnap. This time, I decided to do frigid outskirts because I just wanted to get it out the way, honestly. The twin tigers were pretty annoying, the part where both are attacking at once is just so unbalanced. I thought it was safe to heal here, but apparently not. It's super important to keep the focus on Lud and just cast occasional heavenly thunders when you can. A lot of patience is needed as the windows to attack are slim, and mistakes mean you could get bludgeoned by these cats, but once Lud goes down, Zalan is not too bad. I focus on dodging only while it's buffed until it wears off. The crown restoring my spell casts is a lifesaver. It was another 12 minute fight, but finally we end this encounter with this cat feeling thoroughly crestfallen. Weird, I went to get the knights but the NPC summon that literally always happens here just didn't. Last DLC boss. Ivory King was a bit annoying, mainly the knight phase, but Heavenly Thunder again comes in clutch when loads of knights are in one place. I went with Great Lightning Spear for the king himself. Ivory much wanted to avoid having to do the knights again if I could so I even popped a bright bug at the start. Patience was key, I, I did fail many dodges to be honest but luckily was able to recover. I also munched spellcast recovery at the right moment. With enough spears and me somehow surviving, Ivory King goes down. I realised I never buffed the crown's last playthrough so I went to grab Vendrick's crown. I have the power! It's a bit pointless though as the buff doesn't carry over to the next cycle, but might as well do it once. Throne Watcher and Defender were laughably easy compared to all the previous bosses, just look at the damage from Heavenly Thunder there. I did nearly die from a mistimed dodge, but overall this was super easy. Down in under a minute, they got thoroughly dethroned. Okay, so buffing the crowns did have one benefit. The curse from the Chandra does nothing, so at the beginning, I just spam Heavenly Thunder and nuke her health. Absolute joke. And then Audia is no tougher, just takes longer as I have to wait to attack, but soon we give him Scolariosis and down he goes. Easy victory. This time, I enclose myself in a dark room, similar to the one I'm sitting in while playing this run to be honest, and then we head to New Game Plus Plus for hexes. We've made it to the halfway point. This should be interesting as everything I've read or seen suggests that hexes are insanely OP, so let's see if that still holds true for New Game Plus Plus. I'm sick of these old women already. We get to Medulla and then go Cheese Dragon Rider again. I nearly messed it up, but still got it because he sucks. We get Lysia to move and open the way to Huntsman's Cops, where we speak to this guy who we have an instant fell kinship with. He gives us the Sunset Staff, which is the best staff for hexes. We also buy all his hexes, but mainly Dark Orb. All the others require you to use souls, and Dark Orb is just pretty amazing. Okay, with an unupgraded staff the damage isn't that good, but it's going to get a lot better, trust me. To keep my mind active during this never ending saga, I ran around this area, aggroed all the enemies, got footage of them all chasing me, and then made a video critiquing Dark Souls 2 for having too many ganks and being unfair. We buy Melentia's stuff, unlock Lenegrass shop, and upgrade our staff to plus 3 with twinkling I had on me. At this point, I decided things were going too smoothly so I thought it was time to do something stupid. Let's try kill this Ian the Guard Dragon without killing any of the other enemies on the way to him. This went about as well as you'd expect. I finally did it though, even if I died instantly after. Totally 100% the two hours this took. I then ran to pull the lever and face the old dragon slayer. He's pretty easy, just run around, spam dark orb, it has decent damage and fast cast time. I really thought he'd be resistant to dark, but apparently not, which left our dragon slaying buddy feeling pretty forlornstein. But thankfully, that didn't mean he'd invade me repeatedly for the rest of the game. Let's press on and use our flexes to take on the Hexile Sentry. Two orbs kill the additional mobs, although it gets pretty hairy at points. With them dead, this becomes quite straightforward and we can then activate the bonfire in the Lost Bastille. Back to Forest of the Fallen Giants, I opted to kill the pursuer on first encounter this time. It took ages to do, but Dark Orb was pretty pursuitable for the job given its high amount of casts. Conversely, the last whole face was a massacre of giant proportions. We can now do the usual stuff to get to Strayed, to buy another Dark Orb, Dark Hail and Dark Fog. Killing the Pursuers for Twinkling as well, let's upgrade our staff to plus 4. As well as Dark Orb, Dark Fog is also an awesome Hex, and what better boss to test it on than the easily poisoned Rune Sentinels. It's so quick to cast, and procs poison even quicker. Dark Hail is the equivalent of Dark Bead from Dark Souls 1, but it's nowhere near as OP, although the damage is still quite good. We damage Alessia loads before Christina Ricci gets involved. 
dark fog can poison both at once as well, which is pretty awesome, and we prune these sentinels from the tree of life. We kill another pursuer, and I'm going to do the belfry gargles right now. Dark fog helps loads as they can be poisoned for some reason. Dark hail helps to damage multiple gargs, but there's still a lot of running away. I very nearly died, but pulled it back even though all of them were active. I stayed calm and didn't bell freak out, allowing me to pull off the win. You know, I'm starting to realize why Dark Orb is supposedly OP. It's not even the damage as such, although that's pretty good. It's the cast speed, huge amount of casts, and also how little stamina it uses, compared to the lightning spears that were taking off half my stamina bar. Lost Sinner next. So annoyingly the pyro guys that join dodge Dark Orb relentlessly, but Dark Fog once again comes in clutch as one proc of poison kills them outright. With them dead, we can Dark Orb the Lost Sinner in between their attacks. I was somewhat sin nervous that I'd choke at the last minute, but thankfully not, and the first great soul is ours. Onwards to Shaded Woods now, and we grab three more Twinkling. With this, the staff is now plus five, maxed out already, but we also unlock Macduff and Dark Infuse the staff for extra damage. So let's start smashing out bosses in rapid succession. Nashka has no choice but to hail me as her Scorpion King. Royal Rat Authority gets eradicated. Freya runs away after we deal loads of damage to her. Congregation becomes intoxication when we spray them with repeated dark fogs. With Freya down to 60% health from before, this is quicker than usual and just a few dark hails to the face make Freya bomb harder than Madam Web at the box office. Returning to Huntsman's Cops, this red phantom couldn't absorb our hexes. Executioner's chariot got melted down and turned to glue. And further through the cops, this guy handily blocked the doorway, allowing me to dark fog this big gaggle of enemies. For the skeleton lords, I didn't really have anything that could handle a big group, so I killed one lord at a time, then picked off the minions, then killed another lord, and repeat until all dead. Well, more dead, I guess. I speak to Cloan to grab dead again, which makes hollows explode. Wonder when that will come in handy. Spoiler, it never came in handy. Pyromancers, of course, one-shot me. Die, die, die! Covetous Demon actually can't be poisoned. Interesting. A lot of bosses can be poisoned, but seems he's the exception. Anyway, Dark Hail. Mitha obviously can't be poisoned. Dark Orb continues to be exemplary though, and it's not long before Mitha is headed to a quick demise. We keep ironing out enemies in the Iron Keep, Sharon took great offensive to our power, and Dennis gets a strong dose of Carmor. Smelter Demon actually can be poisoned, which I always found kind of weird because it doesn't look like he should be susceptible, but I'm not complaining. Look at him jive there, he's doing the Helter Smelter. Dark Orb and Poison does great damage here, and before long he's down. After bullying Turtle Knights and getting this NPC to burn himself again, it's time for Old Iron King. I didn't even need to poison him, but I did anyway, and then used Dark Hail a bunch to end this King's Iron Fisted reign. So for the final Lord Soul, we head down the Medulla Pit, and take out the other rat boss on the way. A shame they can't be poisoned and Dark Orb doesn't one-shot the rats, but it's still no issue as their movements aren't too erratic. Extermination complete. Down in Black Gulch, we kill one of the Lost Boys and even these giants on New Game Plus Plus get melted by Dark Fog. I'm really starting to understand why people say hexes are OP. Dark Fog is probably pretty close to Dark Orb in terms of how much it crushes certain enemies. After sending this other Lost Boy back to Neverland, I speak to... Do you mind? I'm trying to tell Santa what I want for Christmas. So the Rotten can be poisoned, but he has fairly high resistance, and at one point the cloud stopped me from seeing his attack. Eh, at least it made the fight a little hex sighting for once. I was curious if Dead Again did anything to him, but no. Dark Orb and Dark Hail melt him down quickly though. Now, with the Lord's Souls done, I'm going for a big route change up. I still wanted proper access to Dragon Lake Castle though, so I quickly ran in and sorted out the Twin Dragon Riders, which was an embarrassing fight for me because I actually nearly choked at one point, yeah. But anyway, this is what we're doing right now, Elium Lois, right away. After getting my eyes priestested, we can now see this boss thanks to removing my cataracts. Arva can be poisoned, but it takes many casts and the damage is so small it's just not even really worth it. So I stuck with hail and orbs. Damage hasn't dropped off as much as miracles did, at least so far, so this is a fairly quick win. I get rid of the storm and then take a cough drop to my inevitable demise. Worth noting here that I'm just going to run through using the NPC summons to distract the reindeer and then dismiss them at the fog gate and make a save state because I've already done this twice and this run is dragging as it is. Simple enough, eh? Nearly there now. What the f- Are you kidding me? 
They added a red phantom right by the fog gate in New Game Plus Plus. That is cruel. The difficulty is, I need to banish the NPCs to make a save state, so having to do that at the end while not dying and exit the game is such a mess. Eventually I pulled it off, reloaded, dodged this guy, and ran through the fog gate somehow. Lud and Zalem were easier than actually just getting to them this time. I used Dark Orb initially to whittle Lud down, but saved Dark Hail for when Zalen got involved to finish Lud off as quickly as I could. Thankfully, their health isn't too ludicrous, so Kitty One gets catnipped. With Zalen, I used Dark Fog when it started to regen health to at least counteract some of the health it was regaining. And once the buff wore off, we're thankfully able to finish it. Thank god that's over. Oh wait, I still have to do it one more time. I'm able to flex her on the Hexer, free the Knights, and then see that the damage from this avalanche doesn't snowball with new game cycles, as now it doesn't kill the enemies on the bridge as they have too much health. Also, Donna did spawn this time, so no idea why she didn't before in the last cycle. If anyone has any insight on this, please let me know in the comments below, and make sure to put the words fun fact at the beginning of your comment. Now, for Ivory King... Wait, did my own knight just take a swing at me? What is going on with this game? For the night phase, Dark Fog sped it up a lot, and actually my knight had a good deal of health when we got to Ivory King. He put in work, and I thought he actually might have survived till the end. No, Peter! I nearly burnt out right at the end here with some mistimed dodges, but pulled it back and won. Always surprises me that the bosses here don't speak in really high-pitched voices. Why did they call it Helium Lois then? Continuing the reverse DLC order, Broom Tower. We sneaky sneak through, but guess what? There's a new red phantom by this bonfire. I actually forgot about him while using an effigy after resting and got backstabbed with a whip. Hurt my neck a lot. I'm taking legal action if this guy's giving me whiplash. For the room of hell, I managed to dark fog enemies through this little nook in the bars, and then I also dark fogged Quinoa Rachel. As always, I go with the worst option first in Iron Passage, but hey, at least it's better than the fridge out. What the f? Yeah. <laughs> Who in the blue hell thought this was the area that needed more enemies in New Game Plus Plus? I mean, thankfully, Blue Smelter is weak to poison and dark, so I did him first try, so I didn't need to do it again. Until the next cycle, at least. Fume Knight, on the other hand, definitely has some higher dark resistance and is immune to our poisonous perfume. But Dark Orb just has so many casts and is so quick to use that it's easy to just base an attack, cast, dodge, and repeat. Again, it is crazy how much this boss's difficulty goes down when you do a ranged hit and run build. So, I went to do Sir Alon, but I realised that actually I can't as I don't have the Ash and Mist Heart from the base game. That's a nice little attention to detail. Sir Alive is allowed to remain Alon, for now. On to Sunken King DLC, and you get a Dark Orb, and you get a Dark Orb, and you get a- So guess what the gank squad are all vulnerable to? That's right, poison. So, Dark Fog rinsed through them with relative ease. I handled this in such gangster fashion that they started calling me Snoop Fog. Dark Orb finishes off Fog, and the bad DLC bosses are now all finished up. But my woes are only just beginning. Alana was by far the hardest fight, not just in the Hexes section, but in the whole run up to this point. She takes minimal damage, and so does Velstad, who for some reason she now likes to summon a lot, compared to the previous two cycles. I had one of the worst chokes ever here after fighting her for 16 minutes. She and her summons can't be poisoned either, so using that to help whittle things down is not an option. I died a lot here, probably more deaths on this than everything else put together so far, and it was pain, a truly squalid experience indeed. On the winning attempt, she summoned Velstad three times in a row, and let me say again, it takes ages to kill him, and because she also takes so little damage, there's no chance she'll be dead before she summons again and I do not want to contend with both Velstad and the Skeletons. I tried out Dark Greatsword, which I'd just got in this DLC, and it did the best damage so far. It was a near 20 minute fight in the end, at one point my staff broke and I had to go into my inventory and use repair powder while being chased by Velstad and Alana. After several deaths, and a lot of patience, I managed to win, but wow was I not expecting this level of brutality. Sin, comparatively, was much more straightforward. The damage still wasn't great, but it was just fighting one enemy at a time. It took a lot of Dark Orbs and some Dark Greatswords to the face, but finally we execute our Sin condition and end this fight. DLC is all done, bar Sir Alon. Back to Drang Lake Castle in the base game, the enemies feel so weak here compared to the onslaught we just went through. Even the Red Phantom up here dies easily. 
After once again forcibly entering the King's Passage, we take on the Looking Glass Knight, who handily can be poisoned. Dark Fog, followed by Dark Hail up close, does great damage, although his shield can still reflect all our projectiles if we're in the wrong spot. I'm going a bit glassy-eyed by this point, but we just have to keep pressing forward. We blast through all Shrine of Amana enemies, except this Dragon Rider. Why the hell does he have so much health? I do my usual trick of luring the Archdrakes to the house. Hey, where is he? Oh my god, he came from behind. Then Kinder lure this NPC into this building and blast him too. Demon of Song was pitiful. He croaked in short order. I was getting pretty sick of Aldia. I tried attacking him to shut him up, but it didn't work. Velstad is another of a few bosses that have very high dark resist, but nowhere near the health of the DLC bosses, and I'm now super familiar with his moves after killing him about 20 times during that Elena fiasco. My Aegisteria continues as he once again is downed. We get the King's Ring and Dark Fog this guy on the way to Aldia's Keep, killing an invisible hollow accidentally. Nice, I've actually never killed one before. The best swordsman ever gets dropped, and Ian the Guard Dragon III gets poisoned and blasted down quick. Even the Drake Keepers and Gaia the Dragon Champion go down easy to Dark Orb. Ancient Dragon gives heart, and then gets poisoned and hailed to death very quickly. Less quick than the Miracle Run, but still efficient, stopping the fight from Dragon on like it normally does. Just wait for the next cycle though, oh boy. We only need to do the Giant Memory with Giant Lord, as I have enough Giant Souls on me from previous cycles. Giant Lord is laughably easy. Ignore that. I said ignore it. Anna Vendrick is also easy as usual. Hey look, I got a million souls. I don't even know what to level up anymore. Vitality, I guess. To finish off the base game, I take on the final boss trio. Throne Watcher and Defender can both be poisoned, so Dark Fog again puts in the work. I'm almost throwing it in at this point as I watch their health bars deplete. The Chandra can also be poisoned and is not as resistant to dark as you might think. That's some decent yellow in her health bar from my attacks. She eventually turns to Ash, which we build a Nashand castle with. Aldia actually is much more resistant surprisingly, and this takes a while because of the usual waiting for attack opportunities. But once his guard is down, he's like an Aldea in the headlights as we projectile him into the next cycle. I didn't want to see the credits, so I tried to warp out with a homeward bone, but it just puts you right back in. I left the throne room this time, and then I found the most amazing thing. You can skip the credits in New Game Plus. Game changer. So, we still have two bosses left to do. Seralon being one of them. They of course added a red phantom outside the fog gate to make his joyous run back even more joyous. Seralon is much easier than the miracle run honestly. Sure our damage isn't the best, but the speed of Dark Orb is so much better than the lightning spears. I tried to use Dark Greatsword, but I paid for it. I felt ambivalent to how much the extra damage was worth it, so I stuck to one Dark Orb in each opening and managed to stay focused for 5 whole minutes until he went down. Last but not least, I've left a fitting final boss for the Hex Run. A extraordinary choice, some might say. I speak to Dark Santa and easily clear out the chasms. So Dark Lurker does indeed resist Dark strongly again, much like Velstad, but also like Velstad, its health is nowhere near the DLC bosses. I did have one extremely frustrating death though. I got stuck on this bit of ground trying to get away. Who the hell left that lurking there? God damn it. It's a fun fight actually, apart from that dodging and weaving through projectiles, and returning fire with our own. It gets intense at points, but not frustrating like Alana was. Genuinely enjoyed this one. I, I, I think my, my, my sanity's kind of fraying at the edges here. Dark Lurker goes down, and the Hex Run is complete. We've made it to the final cycle. Pyromancy in Dark Souls 1 and 3 was crazy overpowered, so I'm sure we'll smash right through this, right? After running through the starting section, I've now been hearing these women's voices so much in my dreams that I can't even tell if I'm awake or asleep right now. I hope this is the last time. Hope. In Medulla, I don't have it in me to even bother speaking to the Emerald Herald or Lenagrast so they can remain in purgatory forever. Instead of cheesing Moom and Ryder, we go to Melentia and buy a stinky branch of your mama. We then run to free Rosa Beth, who we Rosa dress up like a horny Vendrick. I then break my own rule and I equip Pyro Flame, which just appeared out of thin air. What's that? Get the Dark Pyromancy Flame from the gutter. You go get it. You go get it! Rosabeth is now Medulla, and we buy Fireball, Fire Orb, Combustion, Poison Mist, Flash Sweat, and Iron Flesh. We upgrade Pyro Flame to plus five with seeds we have on us. Let's seed how we get on. How's this for a weird first boss choice? Royal Rat Vanguard. 
Damage isn't great, but it's an easy boss and Fire Orb does enough, I guess. The treasure it was vanguarding was actually its soul. You'll see why later. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. <laughs> Next, we kill the pursuer with poison. Slow to cast, but helps chip him down. See that health bar deplete? Tick. 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 Let's get that shortcut open, and then poison and combustion brings the last giant down quickly for the last time. Fly to Lost Bastille, grab another disgustingly vile smelling branch and the antiquated key, and we get the Macduff bonfire etc blah blah blah. Next, I decided to kill Dragon Rider normally for once, it should be easy. <clears throat> so anyway, Dragon Rider met with an unfortunate accident. Oops. Flexile Sentry was actually kinda annoying, mainly because of the shadows. Poison Mist can take them out, but they keep interrupting my cast. Turns out it's a lot slower than Dark Fog was. Eventually they die, but water reduces my fire damage and slows my reflexes. It took a while, but Flexile Sentry goes down. Really hope there's not loads more water throughout the game reducing my damage. We get to Strayed easily next, and trade the Rat Vanguard Soul for Toxic Mist. To further increase our arsenal, we next need to do Executioner's Chariot, as there's some stuff we need behind this boss. I got to test out Poison and Toxic at the same time, and it does melt boss health bars, although the cast time for both is pretty slow. I wonder if anyone has ever been toxic in a Souls game before. With the horse divorced from this mortal coil, we speak to a character with an incredible name, Titchy Gren. If we join his covenant, he sells us Firestorm, Great Combustion, and Fire Whip. Fire Whip is incredible for certain enemies that can be staggered like Rowena, Great Combustion does loads of damage although the range is short, and Firestorm at least tells me how many casts I have unlike Dark Souls 1. Seriously, why did they do that? I want names. Skeleton Lords had a similar strategy to the Sorcery Run. Bone Wheel Boy first, and then Torch the other two Lords. You can Firestorm the group of skeletons repeatedly, although there is some water in here so again the damage is slightly reduced compared to if the room was bone dry. But, with enough skeletons destroyed, we then use Fire Whip for the last few. Given our damage hasn't been firing on all cylinders so far, we grab another Fire Seed from Harvest Valley, and upgrade the Pyro Flame to max already, because this is New Game++++ plus 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 and we need to stop screwing around. Weirdly, I have the easiest time killing the Desert Pyromancers with Pyro. Such a Pyrodox. Flame Grilled covered his demon, I call that a Jab Barbecue. We fireball this guy off the ledge, and Fire Whip these Mana Kindreds of Rot. Mitha is the last of the bosses for a while that can't be poisoned thankfully. Great Combustion does by far the best damage, but gotta be close and even then it's not amazing. Seems like a real spike in difficulty for the pyro run already. It took longer than expected, but at this point I'm insane in the membrane, full queen in the bane. In Iron Keep, Alon Knights resist fire, but at least I can still push them off into lava. But I really couldn't be bothered with the NPC invaders this time, so I ran to Smelter. He huffs on our poison and toxic clouds like they were a smelt tip pen. Both of them really melt his health bar. Obviously, he has huge fire resist, but not a huge issue when we drain his health this fast. Beyond him, we can grab Chaos Storm. Just gotta get to this chest across the lava past this red phantom. Super easy, no problem. Ah, screw it, you know what, we don't need this anyway. I trick all the knights to drown in lava because I can't drown my own sorrows. For Old Iron King, Poison and Toxic are the main damage dealers again, as fire resistance is huge obviously. Still feels ironic to kill him with Pyro though. Gotta love that tick tick tick. First great one is a one and done. I make a quick trip back to the Lost Bastille for Ruined Sentinels, they get melted by Poison and Toxic even more than anything else so far, and take okay damage from fire, so the Sentinels get sent to hell. Also the Belfry boys gargle on my Toxic, they certainly won't be missed. But instead of Lost Sinner now, we jam to Shaded Woods with help from Firestorm. Nashka here is not too resistant to fire, we fire whip in a circle to give this scorpion a ring sting. Royal Rat Authority was actually fine, because Firestorm killed all the little tosses in one attack. I'm pretty happy that we're done with that one. In Brightstone Cove, the mob's health is now too high for this boulder to kill. We then say Heia to Freya, and the Congregate Gatekeepers get misted for a very easy kill. Freya does not like fire. Great Combustion was the most consistent damage easily, although we have to be up close. After four defeats in a row, Freya retires to give medical advice at WebMD, and our second Great One is finished. We grab the Brightstone Key now and get Great Fireball. This does decent damage, but enemy health is pretty high now. Oh hey, this guy dropped Lingering Flame. Lost Sinner was annoying because it's much more difficult to even hit the Pyromancers, let alone take them out considering they resist fire. 
I actually just dodged them and took out the sinner as I found it easier, but I still had to kill them afterwards. Your sins will be punished. Down in the Black Gulch, fireballs knocked the woodland children off into oblivion, and then I found a nice shortcut, totally intentionally obviously. Toxic and poison the giants, and then do the same to the rotten. He actually resists fire, poison, and toxic, which makes sense given where he lives I suppose. Still, he takes enough damage that there's not much rotention here, and I get him down. The approach to Drang Lake Castle, however, was awful. The enemies take reduced fire damage in the rain, and this red phantom needed to die here so I had time to take the enemies out. He was legit harder than most bosses, and took absolutely ages to kill. I then abused Toxic to take out the knights and open the door. For the first time, being in New Game++ plus 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 actually plays in our favour as we get Great Chaos Fireball from the Chancellor. This is normally locked behind a Covenant in the earlier cycles, but can be bought from him in New Game++ plus plus and beyond. Twin Dragon Riders get dropped, the Pyromancers get bopped, and the Red Phantom with the Long Sword gets Chaos Fireballed before we fiercely and dominantly power into the King's Passage with our burning hand. Rain reduces the power of fire, so our damage against Looking Glass Knight is nerfed, but luckily can be poisoned and toxic. Seems like there's so many scenarios where Pyro gets nerfed due to water, but as far as I know there's no scenario where Pyromancy gets a buff and Lightning gets a nerf. Even the summons take several hits. But despite this disadvantage, they're not able to rain on our parade, but seeing a looking glass is appropriate as I'm starting to feel like the Mad Hatter. Well, Shrine of Amana, given it's covered in water, I'm just running through, which I somehow managed despite the hordes of enemies. Demon of Song is also in water, but obviously very weak and goes down to our Akapyro. We activate the Undead Crypt Bonfire, but return to Shrine of Amana to grab Fire Tempest, hidden all the way out here. Then we surpass the Usurper and mission to Velstad. Our damage is actually good for once, at least from Great Chaos Fireball. Shame it has so few casts. Poison and Toxic work, but they're too slow to cast outside of the phase transition and projectile attack. The Vel tolls for Belstad, and we grab the King's Ring. Because we can, I decided to take out Vendrick while we're here. I actually died once right near the end, just look at the damage from his attack. Otherwise, just stick to his back leg, use a lot of fireballs, leaving this king venerable no more. Onwards to Audius Keep for the pyromancy I've been waiting for. By showing Navland several items implying we killed certain NPCs, he gives Forbidden Sun, supposedly the best pyromancy in the game. It takes three slots to equip though, and we only get two casts of it, so that's not great. Ian the Guard Dragon definitely didn't nearly kill me. He didn't. Stop saying he did. Poison and Toxic helped as he resists fire. We won't be seeing Ian again. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> in Dragon Shrine, we drake these keepers in two hits, which is sweet, but display far more toxic behavior for the champion. In my mind, I was thinking this run was nearly over, but then I remembered there's still a bunch of fire resisting bosses, and Ancient Dragon is indeed one of them. We do very little damage. I actually ran out of casts, and while looking to see if I had any spell restorers, I got stomped and one shot from full health. After fighting him for 18 minutes. After restocking from Welliger, I got Poison Mist back on the go, and after another 18 plus minutes of fighting Ancient Dragon, he at last goes down. I, I feel ancient myself after, after that. Giant Lord Ran, by comparison, was much easier and took considerably more damage, so easy easy. But is it, f is it, is it fun? Uh, are, are we having fun still? We're almost finished with the base game. Despite our damage being good, especially from Forbidden Sun and Great Chaos Fireball, the Throne duo were the hardest of any of the runs. Their damage is really high right now, and the low cast from our strongest pyromancies really hamper us in this encounter. Death was certain, but it was still a throne call I didn't want to answer, because death always calls collect. Next time, I use Toxic to help chip away, and once the Watcher is down, Defender thankfully is pretty straightforward, and we bring him down before he can revive his friend. Nishandra was no issue apart from running out of cast due to how high her health is now. I did also curse a lot. Sorry, I meant get cursed a lot. Actually, it was both. I was a bit worried about Audia due to his fire resistance, and although it's higher than many other bosses, at least we're getting yellow on the health bar. Yellow, is it me you're looking for? I've literally got no idea what I'm saying at this point. Audia was not so bad, just long, just long, just long. We seal ourselves away for the last time and prepare for the Dark Lurker, the final boss of the base game. Toxic really helps with the chasms as Dark Fog did in the previous cycle. 
Well, that guy's having a whole lot of fun. So I have to give it to Pyromancy here. This was actually the easiest Dark Lurker fight of the run, despite it being New Game++++. Plus Plus Plus. Fire does loads of damage for once, and actually the boss was nearly dead by the time they split. Fire Tempest finishes it off, but are we done? Are we done? No, of course not. It's time for DLC, standing for Dad Looking Crazy, which is probably what my son thought when he saw me. Let's do Sunken King DLC first. At least I can hit this switch with a fireball, which is... So, some... something. Ilana was a concern after how bad the last fight was, and I had way less cast this time, so I decided to try a different approach. I wasn't going to kill the summons at all, and just focus on Ilana. Not too bad with just Velstad, but pretty chaotic with the skeletons as well. Very hard to find openings, and honestly, if I didn't like this fight before, I now absolutely despise it after doing this run. I think it's given me a bad case of Alana Rhea. But somehow, after nearly 15 minutes of running around, restoring spell casts, and occasionally actually getting to attack, we managed to defeat her for the final time. Now, if you can believe it, Sin actually took even longer than Ancient Dragon. Our damage is pretty low, and Sin decided to fly around for about 8 years. Also, he's immune to Toxic, of course. I never imagined Pyromancy would make me make me feel so weak. My once glorious flame is nothing more than cinders. Why is this happening? It was so good in Dark Souls 1 and 3. It took a long time, tw 20 minutes all told, but finally he, he goes down. DLC 1 is over. No respite, though. We, we push through the cold to fight more tigers. Arva was way less annoying than any of the Sunken King bosses. Damage is still not amazing, weirdly, but at least it's just one-on-one -on -one with fairly predictable attacks. No idea how I survived this grab, though. After taking advantage of every available opening, we're one step closer to ending this. In my delirium, I realized I had forgotten one pyromancy, Flame Swath. It might come in handy just for more casts if nothing else. Also got rid of Toxic Mist, as it's too slow for this next fight. It's Ivory King time. The Flame Swath has a delayed cast, but deals good damage actually. Might have helped if I got this earlier. Oh well. The biggest problem, which is a bit of a running theme with Pyromancy, is I ran out of casts and had no spell restorers left, so I tried to wait out to get the spell restore from the crown, and I died after 10 minutes. How many times has this happened on this run so far? Seriously. So I went to buy Rouge Water from Strayed and Crimson Water from Navlan, and went back to take on this Averitable Challenge. With the knights, I just kept distance and took pot shots, and then I necked Crimson Water and a Bright Bug as the Ivory King arises. This is the only fight I've been consistently using Bright Bugs, because I just want to try avoiding having to do the knights bit again. Thankfully, our loyal companion helps loads, distracting the king, and only dies when Ivy has low health. Maybe I should have used Toxic, then the king could have been Poison Ivy. Spell Restorers give me the arsenal I need to at last end this one. So we're done with this DLC, right? Let's move on to the old Iron King. Oh, God damn it! fine! Frigid Outskirts, I still hate it. What more do you want me to say? I didn't bother with the NPC summons knowing the red guy was at the end here, but I did manage to exit and save state. As for the Tigers, damage is pretty decent here, but unfortunately I died to the pure power of this kitty's elbow. I'm not even going to say anything further about that. Next try, it's the usual story. Once one kitty goes down, I can beat it even though I've seemingly entered a catatonic state. I never want to see snow or tigers ever, ever again. The end is in, in sight. I took revenge on this NPC for that nonsense from last time with the whip, and then managed to somehow get this lever pulled without being interrupted. Let's end this. Blue Smelter with any poison build is absolutely not an issue. It's a shame he's so weak to it, but that's just the hand he's been smelt. It's mainly just surviving and not messing up for that time. To be fair, our fire does fine damage, I guess, so it's not completely redundant. But would you believe me if I told you the longest fight of the run ha has not yet happened? <laughs> After a painful descent, seriously, this room caused me so much aggro this time, I get rid of poison and toxic mist, as neither of them are useful anymore. So let's get rid of these statues to... Oh, I didn't pick up the wedges. Oops. So Fume Knight, how much damage do you think fire does against this guy? Yeah, I died actually several times here because I just kept losing concentration. My mind is really, really deteriorating. Here, this run has really confirmed my soul. I failed again and again. 
I never imagined that any magic run would involve me doing so little damage at this stage, but somewhere in between all of the deaths, I finally realised the truth about pyromancy at this stage in the run. The flame represented my spirit. It started off strong as a blazing bonfire when I begun this crazy endeavour, but over time that fire has died, dwindling down to almost nothing. Just like my soul, it's almost extinguished, but I can't let it die yet. It's not time. So we keep that fire burning just a little longer. Soon I can rest. After 23 minutes, Fume Knight is defeated. Before we take on the final encounter, I go to Ornifex and buy all her spell restoring items. Then I return to Medulla for one last bit of unfinished business. <laughs> So, Seralon, the final encounter, we made it. Honestly, this was pretty intense. Maybe it's just because my brain is so fried, but I hesitate on my attacks. I roll too early. Fear grips my spirit every time I try to heal, but I just, I just won't relent. I throw and throw and throw, and eventually, Alon is gone. But what do I do now? Was it worth it? Magic certainly was good at the beginning, at least. I can hold on to that awesome damage we did way back when, like a distant memory, but it doesn't matter now. The challenge is complete, and I can rest. Thanks for watching. I've been JK Leeds. See ya, and have a good one.